In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Please be seated. In Reverend Paul's sermon last Sunday, he called our attention to the Gospel readings for January, focusing on explanations to the why questions implied in Luke's words. Paul said the true realization of why actually did produce an understanding of purpose for Jesus and for others as well. We call these manifestations, epiphanies. Today is the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. During the previous Epiphany Sundays, the following why questions have been discussed. Why was Jesus born? Why did Jesus need to be baptized? Why was Jesus to perform his first public miracle? And why was this itinerant teacher wandering from town to town? Today's scripture reading explains why Jesus' neighbors were disappointed that Jesus wasn't the military messiah that they expected. Jewish tradition belief was that the messiah would claim to lay waste to Israel's enemies and restore Israel to its proper power and peace. As Jesus went home, the villagers enjoyed the miracle worker, but they were disappointed when they learned that what sort of Messiah Jesus was called to be. I recently read a book titled The Second Life of Muriel West, written by Amanda Skinnador. The thought-provoking and sensitive novel was inspired by the true story of the Carville, Louisiana Leprosy Hospital. The people who ended up in Carville Hospital were rejected by their friends and families in their name hometowns. Jesus was also rejected in his hometown. Carville began as a Louisiana leper home in 1894. Two years later, sisters from the Daughters of Charity arrived to help care for the patients. In 1921, the United States Public Health Service took control of the site and it became the National Leposarium. Until the late 1950s, it was legal in most states to forcibly quarantine people of all ages with leprosy which later, later became known as Hansen's disease. Back in the 1920s, it was a terrible time to be diagnosed with leprosy. The hospital turned out to be much like a prison of healing, surrounded by barbed wire fencing. The sisters and doctors did their best to care for the patients with the knowledge they had concerning leprosy but deaths far outnumbered the discharges. Some of the badly afflicted were there for years. Others were relatively unscathed. For all, the disease's stigma was just as insidious as its physical progress. Some of the treatments the patients of all ages received seemed inhumane. Experimental treatments were given to volunteer adult patients desperate to return to a normal life. One was a bizarre fever therapy where patients endured five hours of 150 degree temperatures. They were placed in a tight enclosure with only their heads sticking out so that the nuns could wipe their foreheads with cold cloths. When it was determined the ter therapy wasn't working, the fever therapy stopped. What little I know about leprosy mainly came from the Bible. Upon doing research for this sermon, I discovered that biblical references of lepers probably involved various repulsive skin diseases rather than leprosy as it is known today. Interestingly, I learned the disease treated in Carville was really a bacterial infection known as Hansen's disease. It is not very contagious. In fact, 95% of adults cannot catch it because our immune systems readily fight off the bacteria. 
It is not the same that is referenced in the Bible. Also, it is not a result of uncleanliness or an immoral lifestyle. The author in her notes at the end of the book stated that she didn't realize the disease had once been an endemic. Endemic means a disease is mainly confined to a given area. In this case, leprosy was prominent in the southern states of our country. Between 150 and 250 cases are still reported each year. The people confined to Carabelle Hospital suffered, and some even triumphed. The stigma they fought and endured brought about change. Thankfully, Carvel Leprosy Hospital no longer exists. Now the site is used by the Louisiana National Guard. Today, the disease is treated in outpatient clinics using a combination of antibiotics taken over two years. Now, 100 years later, we are in a worldwide pandemic with COVID. How will we successfully bring about change and hopefully an end to worries and suffering? This is a terrible time to be a member of a school board. Mask mandates and COVID protocols have triggered a firestorm of anger among some parents with lots of why questions. School board members, many of whom are volunteers, have been subject to verbal abuse, harassment, intimidation, and in some cases, violence. What has been happening has been far beyond the reasonable exercise of one's First Amendment rights. One Michigan board member says, I think that the biggest problem that I see for our members is the lack of civility from the public about really tough decisions that volunteer school members are trying to make for people on both sides of the issue. He said, I empathize with parents who don't like what's happening but our board members are not experts. So they turn to health department experts for guidance to do what is best for the public. At a Birmingham Board of Education meeting, a man flashed a Nazi salute and shouted, Heil Hitler, in response to a Jewish woman and a black woman expressing support for mask mandate. A school board member later said, it becomes such a personal thing for every adult involved and they're just looking out for what's best for their kids. The drama of it all is often so often fear-based. Emotions take control and logic doesn't always matter at that point. A Wisconsin school board member, a retired educator, points out, when I got on our board, I knew it would be difficult, but I wasn't ready or prepared for the caustic response that would occur especially now that the pandemic seems to just bring everything out in a very, very harsh way. It made it impossible to really do any kind of meaningful work. What is the message God has for us in today's Gospel from Luke, as well as the stories I just shared about the stigma and controversy of leprosy and COVID? I believe the gospel calls us to embrace Jesus' vision of a world remade, remade in everyday expressions of hope, love, and compassion that are the first signs of the coming of God's kingdom. We need to look beyond our needs and our fears that limit our image of what is right. We are called to be prophets of what is good, however unpopular it might make us. A prophet isn't always accepted in his or her own part of the world, but neither was Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in baptism, all of us are called to be prophets and examples of what is good, however unpopular that may be, make us. Fill us with love, hope, and compassion to make a difference during trying times. Help us to carry on the work you have given us to do. Amen. Mm -hmm. I just want to add one other comment. <clears throat> 
this is the book that I read. And it was a hard book to read, but at the same time, it was very interesting. It was shocking to me. I did not know anything about the Louisiana Carroll Hospital. Um, the characters in here are fictional, but yet the facts about what took place in that hospital are accurate. If you are interested, I'd be happy to share it. You can pass it on, and then you can pass it on to somebody else. But I had David read it, and he thought it was equally as good. So I'm highly recommending it.